Turning in our hymn books to the Psalm 23. The Psalm 23 on page 20. Well known shepherd Psalm, the Lord is my shepherd, I not want. He makes me down to lie. In pastures green, he leadeth me the quiet waters by. The Psalm 23 will stand after we get the introduction. <laughs> Lord, we do pray that we will be enabled 
by the Holy Spirit to worship and to glory in our Saviour and to glory in the King of Kings. We thank and we praise thee for another day that thou hast blessed us with. We thank thee already for every blessing that thou hast bestowed upon us. Lord, we do not take anything for granted, but we give thee all of the praise and the glory for the measure of health and strength that we have, for the soundness of mind, for the breath in our lungs, for the clothes upon our backs, Lord, for the ability even to travel and to come to this house today. Lord, we thank thee for the food that we've already been able to consume for even our physical health. And Lord, as we've gathered to thy house, we thank thee for the ability and the opportunity even to gather in this fashion for the freedom which we have. We thank thee, O God, for the word of God in our hearts and in our hands that we have gathered, gathered and carried with us to the house. Lord, we do pray for that spiritual bread, even as we come to this place, as we open up the book, and as we read it, and as we meditate and preach from it. And, oh God, may there be that spiritual bread to feed upon. Lord, we thank thee for each one that is here. We thank thee for the mercy of God in each life. And Lord, we do pray that thou will just continue to be with and to bless each one. Lord, we do acknowledge the days in which we're living in our hard days, but yet we rejoice that there is nothing too hard for our Saviour. We thank thee that he is the great burden bearer. He's the one that we can cast all of our care upon, knowing that he cares for us. And Lord, we commit each one into thy hands again today. We thank thee, O God, for the recommencement of our Sabbath school. Lord, we rejoice in this. We rejoice in every child and young person that was gathered out this morning. We rejoice, O oh God, once again in the abilities that thou hast given to thy servants to minister to them. Lord, we pray that those children, Lord, will be encouraged even at the opportunity to gather to this house. We thank thee for parents that send them. Lord, we pray that that word that has been sown this morning, Lord, that it will bring forth fruit. Those boys and girls that are still outside of Christ will be, Lord, strangely awoken this day by the Holy Spirit. And their hearts will be opened. And they will cry out to thee for salvation. We think of the children in the Sabbath school that are saved. O oh Lord, we pray that thou will encourage them in their lives that day by day that they will know the help of the Lord with them, the presence of the Lord with them, and that they will grow in grace and the things of God. Lord, we remember them in their schooling places, and Lord, I know it's the toughness and the hard places that it may be even to take a stand for the Lord in the school place. Lord, we ask thee that thou wilt encourage them, Lord, that they will keep their eyes fixed upon thee. Lord, remember our elderly as well, and we do remember those unable to join with us anymore. We pray for thy blessing to be upon them. We pray, O oh God, for those at home and in nursing homes and hospitals. Lord, that I will undertake for them, for those that are saved, that they will know the presence of God and the joy of the Lord even in their hearts each and every day. But we think of the elderly that are not saved. O oh God, that I will have mercy upon them, that I will save the lost, that I will save, O oh God, the lost and our elderly and our middle age and our young people. Lord, we look at this community and we see many in the road to hell. O oh, Father, that thou wilt, Lord, come in mighty power by thy spirit and blow upon the dearth and the apathy that is found in hearts, the coldness that is there. And Lord, that thou wilt give men and women a hunger and a thirst after righteousness. O oh, Father, undertake, we pray thee, for all of our church services this day. Bless each one where the gospel is being faithfully proclaimed. Bless thy servants, both ministers, licentiates, and the students alike as they handle thy word. O oh, Father, we pray that thou wilt have met with them in a study place. And as they stand with their feet to proclaim thy word, that they will know the presence and the power of the Holy Spirit upon them. Lord, undertake for us in this gathering. Lord, hedges abound in the precious blood of Christ. Keep all other distractions out. And Lord, we'll be careful to give thee the praise and all of the glory. Glorify thy Son and glorify the name and the majesty of God in this gathering, we pray. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Hymn 381.
As we continue to worship the Lord this morning, in hymn 381, you'll find it on the page 330. When upon my spillows you are tempest tossed, when you are discouraged, thinking all is lost, find your many blessings and name them one by one, and it will surprise you what the Lord hath done. 381, we'll stand again after the introduction, please. chief musician on Meganon, a psalm or song of Asaph. Psalm 76, the first one, where God says in Judah is God known, his name is great in Israel. In Salem also is his tabernacle and his dwelling place in Zion. There break he the arrows of the bow, the shield and the sword and the battle. Selah, thou art more glorious and excellent than the mountains of prey. The stout-hearted are spoiled, 
They have slept their sleep, and none of the men of might have found their hands. At thy rebuke, O God of Jacob, both the chariot and the horse are cast into a dead sleep. Thou even now art to be feared, and who may stand in thy sight when once thou art angry. Thou didst cause judgment to be heard from heaven. The earth feared and was still. When God arose to judgment, to save all the meek of the earth, see them. Surely the wrath of man shall praise thee. The remainder of wrath shall thou restrain. Vow and pay unto the Lord your God. Let all that be round about him bring presents unto him that ought to be feared. He shall cut off the spirit of princes. He is terrible to the kings of the earth. Amen. And we trust the Lord will bless the reading of his precious word to our hearts today. Our next hymn is the hymn 443. The hymn 443, the wonderful words, Be still my soul, the Lord is on thy side. Bear patiently the cross of grief or pain. The hymn 443, and we will stand once again after the resurrection. Kings 
James chapter 16. We together those words that we read last week. Starting with verse 29 of the chapter. We commence the series of study in the life of Elijah. We began last week to look at the background and come this week to finish that particular message. 1 Kings 16, verse 29. The thirty and eighth year of Asa, king of Judah, began Ahab, the son of Omri, to reign over Israel. And Ahab, the son of Omri, reigned over Israel in Samaria twenty and two years. And Ahab, the son of Omri, did evil in the sight of the Lord above all that were before him. Came to pass as if it had been a light thing for him to walk in the sins of Jericho, the son of Nebat, that he took to wife Jezebel, the daughter of Ethbaal, king of the Sidonians, and went and served Baal and worshipped him. And he reared up an altar for Baal in the house of Baal, which he had built in Samaria. And they had made a grove. And Ahab did more to provoke the Lord God of Israel to anger than all the kings of Israel that were before him. In the days, or in his days, did Hiel, the Bethlehite, build Jericho. He laid the foundation thereof and Abiram, his firstborn, and set up the gates thereof and his youngest son, Segob, according to the word of the Lord which he spake by Joshua. The Son of Man. Amen. And as always, we believe the Lord will add his own blessing to his precious word. Again, we return, as I said, to consider the faithlessness before Elijah. The faithlessness before Elijah. Let's ask the Lord for his help at this time, please. Father in heaven, as we come now to the preaching part of the service, we Confess afresh our great need of help. Lord, we thank thee for thy presence. We thank thee for the help that thou hast given to each one of us already in this service. Lord, as we have sang thy praise, as we have read thy word, as we have prayed unto thee, O God, we, we thank thee and we praise thee. Lord, that we have not been alone in this regard. And as we continue now, as we Lord, come to the preaching part, we pray that thou will continue to tarry with us. Thou will continue, God, to work in us. Thou will fill us with thy spirit. And Lord, that every word that will be said this morning will be from thee and from thee alone. O God, we just pray that thou will open up every heart. And each and every one this day, their hearts will be open and receptive to thy word. Lord, glorify thy son this day in this house and in each and every life. In his name we pray. Amen. Last week we began our studies in the life of Elijah, a man who was raised up by God at the right time and in the right place. We began by taking that backward look and seeing how far that the children of Israel had fallen, that had experienced those great blessings in the presence of the Lord amongst them in the days of Solomon. We looked at that at the opening of the temple. Whenever all of Israel was gathered together in Solomon on that day, he cried and he led the people in prayer and then the glory of God descended to the point where the priests couldn't even minister in the temple. Such was the uniqueness and the presence of God amongst them. But now, as a nation, they are barely recognizable. The nation is divided and king after king in the northern side of the barrier have led the people further and further away from the Lord. They have committed sin on top of sin. To the point where we read this morning in the verse 30 that Ahab, the son of Omri, the new king, did evil in the sight of the Lord above all that were before him. In verse 33 as well it tells us that he did more to provoke the Lord God of Israel to anger than all the kings of Israel that were before him. The land and the nation of Israel, the northern king, kingdom especially, had apostatized. The church had apostatized. And the people had apostatized. But what is apostasy? 
It's a title that at times is bandied about without proper understanding of what apostasy really is. I went to Dr. Cairns' book, The Dictionary of Theological Terms, and it puts in there that apostasy comes from the Greek word apostasia, meaning a falling away. It is a revolt or a defection from God's truth. Apostasy is a revolt or a defection from God's truth. And certainly before Elijah came, the moral and the religious standards had greatly defected away from the word of God and defected away from the truth that had been given to them. The Israelites in the northern kingdom under Jeroboam and the kings that followed had left the old paths. They had left the proven paths, those God-ordained means or mode of worship that had been given to them from Moses' time right down. Generation after generation, God's law and God's word had stood. And every man and woman and every time and every leader that had followed after the way of God and followed after the word of God had received the blessing of the Lord. But at that time in Elijah's day, the word of God had been set aside to the point that none of it was applied to the nation. Last week, as I said, we began to look at the faithlessness before Elijah and together we looked at the rise of apostasy from the down through the kings, down through the changes that there was. Once again, I have only one point to leave with you this morning. In order to rise in apostasy today, I want us to see the rebellion in apostasy. The rebellion in apostasy. In verse 31, it tells us it came to pass as if it had been a light thing for him to walk in the sins of Jericho, the son of Nebat, that he took to wife Jezebel, the daughter of Ethbel, king of the Sidonians. Now, it wasn't simply that the case that the faith and the worship of God grew cold. We can't say in Elijah's day that it was just a time of when the tide was out and the hearts had grown cold within society, within the church. It wasn't even the case that they had simply just gave up the doctrines, gave up the beliefs of the past. Rather, in the days of Ahab and whenever he married Jezebel, there was an active undertaking to not only disrupt but to dismantle everything that was commanded or given to them by the Lord. In verse 31, it shows how far Ahab had gone, and also how much further he was willing to go. Ahab married Jezebel. She was not from the children of Israel, as we read together. She was a daughter of the king of the Sidonians, Ethel. And whenever those two came together in marriage, it led to an open rebellion which affected every part of life in Israel. Of course, their marriage in itself went against Scripture. On three occasions, the children of Israel had been commanded that they were not to marry outside of the children of Israel itself. The men were not to go to other lands for their wives. The women were not to expect men from other lands to come in and to take them. They had been given to them by, through the mouth of Moses in Exodus 34, verses 12 to 16. It was repeated by Moses in Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy, of course, is the book of the second reading of the law. The end of Moses' life before he will go up to the mountain and die. And has his time as leader is coming to an end, that second book, the, the second reading of the law, the book of Deuteronomy, is just a rehearsal of all of the law to the children of Israel again. He gave it to them in Deuteronomy 7, the verses 1 to 3. And then Joshua, at the end of his time, after the land of Canaan had been defeated, and after the nations and the kingdoms had been de destroyed, and the children of Israel are setting up home. Joshua there in Joshua 23. In the verses 11 to 13, he says this. He says, Take good heed therefore unto yourselves that ye love the Lord your God. Else if ye do, 
And any wise go back and cleave on to the remnant of these nations, even these that remain among you, and shall make marriages with them, and go in unto them, and they unto you. Know for a certainty that the Lord your God will no more drive out any of these nations from before you, but they shall be snares and traps unto you, scourges in your sides and thorns in your eyes, until you perish from off this good land which the Lord your God hath given you. Couldn't make it any more clear, could it? Joshua and his words, they have been given the land, they're standing now in Canaan. It's that land that floweth with milk and honey. It's a land of blessing. It's a land of provision. And yet it's very clear to them and they're told, if you go to any of these nations, if you marry outside of God's people, then all of the blessings, they'll perish. All of the provision, it'll be gone. And that's what happened in Ahab's day. He looked outside and open rebellion of the children of Israel and he went to the other lands for his wife. Not only did he go for a bad one, he went for the worst of the worst. Any word that you read of Jezebel in scripture, she is the worst woman that's ever recorded in God's word. You'll find her in the book of Revelation. Speaks of Jezebel. That's quite a statement to make when you consider some of the other evil women that are found in Scripture, because very soon after Jezebel will come a lady by the name of Athaliah. In reality, she wasn't much of a lady. She was a predator. And she destroyed and killed members of her own family to try and get the kingdom for herself. And yet Jezebel is known in Scripture as being the worst. That's exactly where Ahab went. The alliance and the marriage of Jezebel and Ahab together came and it led to sweeping changes within Israel. Baal became the religion of the land. The king and the government even went so far as to accommodate the religion. Because they purposed and they paid for and they constructed the house of Baal in the land of Samaria, in other words, the northern kingdom. Tells us that in verse 33. The followers of Jehovah also were persecuted. Their voices were silenced. Many of the prophets, the preachers in the land in those days, were killed. Jezebel sent out her men to round them up and to kill them. To the point in 1 Kings 18, 22, Elijah believed that he was the only one that was left. Because he says to the Lord, I, even I only, remain a prophet of the Lord. In other words, every other preacher from every village, every town, Jezebel's got every one of them and she's killed every one of them. No, bit by bit, one by one, Ahab and Jezebel dismantled everything that had anything to do with the Lord God, Jehovah. Now everything that we've noted over both last week and today, in reality can be traced to that desire to rid the land of God's word, and God's law. The moral law, as we know, is summarily comprehended in the Ten Commandments. Those tables of stone that were given to Moses upon Mount Sinai. If you go down through the Ten Commandments, you can see every single one of them. And the actions of Ahab and Jezebel was to eradicate and to dismantle God's law. The first commandment, thou shalt have no other God before me. They brought in Baal. The second commandment, thou shalt, make on, not, thou shalt not make unto me any graven image or any likeness of anything. They set up groves, the golden calves. Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. They preach God's death. Baal's alive. Thou shalt not kill. Yet they murdered prophets. Thou shalt not commit adultery. 
And yet the entire worship of Baal is sensual, adulterous worship. Thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not cause. And yet when Ahab saw Naboth's vineyard, he longed for it to the point where he was happy and Jezebel went ahead and organized the murder of Naboth to get that vineyard for themselves. No, in reality, that's only a number of the commandments we've been through, but in reality, if you go through the lives of Ahab and Jezebel as recorded in the scripture, they dismantled and they went against every single one of the Ten Commandments. Isn't that the case? You can see in our nation and indeed across the world and Christian nations today. Those nations that once had that Christian stand within them, those nations that once defined themselves as being Christian, those nations that once were founded upon Christian principles and upon the Word of God. And yet generation, year by year, decade by decade, the desire is there in society to remove even the Christian influence. Over the last number of decades, we've saw laws regarding the Sabbath, regarding blasphemy, regarding marriage, laws to encourage other religions, laws that take away the authority of the parent over their child, laws to kill the child, every single one. Let's take what God says. Let's get rid of it. No one allowed to his day, the rebellion towards God wasn't even confined to the palace. Verse 34, it tells us, In his days did Hayal the Bethlehemite build Jericho. And Jericho, we know from the book of Joshua, was the first city that was attacked. First city that they came to whenever they crossed over the River Jordan. That great city that was walled up to heaven as it was described. Whenever that city and the walls fell down flat and that city was destroyed and every man, every woman, every child, every beast was destroyed apart from Rahab and those that were found in their household. There was a curse put upon it. Joshua 6, 26, it tells us, Joshua adjured them at that time, saying, Curse be the man before the Lord that riseth up and buildeth the city Jericho. He shall lay the foundation in his firstborn, and in his youngest son shall he set up the gates of law. Let me highlight and just say one thing. That was not simply Joshua speaking. It was not the case that this was Joshua running an adrenaline just so excited and so full of joy because Jericho, the great city, had been defeated. This was not someone that was just filled with furor because of the battlefield. This curse came from God. If you read there in the verse 34 at the end of it, it says, according to the word of the Lord. It wasn't just Joshua, the leader, cursing the city. God cursed the city of Jericho. There in Ahab's day, because of the changes that were in the land, because of the dismantling and because of the disappearance of the godly Christian influence, Hiel takes it upon himself, purposes in his heart, I'm going to build a chair. God's dead. Therefore, that means his curse is dead, doesn't it? He lays the foundation. As he finishes putting the foundations in to the city of Jericho, <coughs> word comes to him, your eldest boy, Byron, is dead. Struck down in an instant. And yet in the midst of the tragedy,
continue to build. He was either completely blind to the warning of God or else he had hardened his heart towards God to the point he just carried on building. And one by one, as he puts block upon block and raises the walls and builds a city, every single one of his children are killed. He has more than two, by the way. And as he continues with that building project, day after day, week after week, another child. Another child. And as he's finishing off the city, he has one son left. And as he puts the finishing touches to the city as he hangs those gates, he gets the final word. See comes dead. You know, God had sent them warning after warning. First one's taken. <coughs> he could have stopped. The second one's taken. He could have stopped. He's down to one. He could have stopped. But he hung the gates. And he buried his final child. You know, from a Christian point of view, as we look at that verse, of course, we believe the Word of God. We believe the promises of God. God promised that if anyone builds that city, I'm going to kill their children. When I punish them, there's a curse upon them. You go against me. And to us, as we read that verse, you know, it almost amazes us that individuals cannot see that God is speaking. <coughs> God is warning. You know, even in the days in which we live and Speaking to different ones over these last number of weeks, there's been so much tragedy, even in this area. People diagnosed with cancer within a very short period of time, just a few days have gone. So far this year, you look at the whole world, we're speaking. An individual the other night, in 2020, wildfires in Australia, locusts in Kenya, the worst they've ever seen with a plague of locusts. Coronavirus, which has shut down the entire world. Wildfires now in California, worse than they've ever seen. And yet people just carry on the darkness. They believe God's dead. Some believe God's not in control. Then you bring it closer to home. As I said, tragedies with illness, tragedies with disease, tragedies, accidents on the road. And to the child of God, we know that God is speaking and these are warning signs from the Lord. He's on the throne. He is in control. He is working out his will and his purpose. And men and women are being warned. The warning signs are all around that they're not in control. That God's in control. And yet how many just simply refuse Turn from their sin. They either don't see it or they will not see it. You know, I said it almost amazes us, but then when we consider the depravity of man, you consider the depths of that depravity and the spiritual darkness that man finds itself in. 
Galatians 5, 17, it says, The flesh lusteth against the spirit, the spirit against the flesh, and these are contrary to one to the other, so that ye cannot do the things that ye would. Romans 3, the verses 10 and follow. It says, As it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. There is none that understandeth, there is none that seeketh after God. They are all gone out of the way, they are, all, they are together become unprofitable. There is none that doeth good, no, not one. Their throat is an open sepulchre, with their tongues they have used deceit. The poison of asps is under their lips, whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood, destruction and misery are in their ways. The way of peace have they not known, there is no fear of God before their eyes. Say that of high enough, couldn't you? We can say that of every one in the days of Elijah. That obeyed and followed after Ahab and Jezebel. Child of God, when we consider the depravity of man, we consider even all of the warnings. Consider the displays of God's power that is being evidenced right across this world. We need to be praying that the Spirit of God would open men and women's eyes. We need to be praying that men and women will see where they are spiritually and see where they're heading eternally. We need to pray that God in His mercy through the warnings that they would see they would see where they are. The men and women would pray and prepare to meet their God. You know what I'm saying this morning? I do pray for you. Pray that the Lord would show you the gravity of your situation. Pray that everything that's happened to you in your point in your life up until this point. Whether it be health scares, tragedies, near misses, the what if moments in your life, the change in circumstances, even in your employment or whatever the case may be, that has come in your life, that you would see the Lord showing you the frailty of life and showing you that you need to be right with God. Hail in his day was given warning after warning. And yet he ignored them. I want to see if you see the warnings today. Do you see your need even to be saved and you see your need to visit Calvary? See, even in the frailty of life and how quickly life is disappearing. The strongest even society can be cut down in a day or a matter of moments. You would see that you need to be washed in the fountain that's drawn from the mountain's feet. Though there are many today that are heading to a Christless eternity. Lost forever. Following after the beliefs that were there in Elijah's day, beliefs that God was dead and his word didn't matter. I encourage each one, don't be like Ahab and Jezebel. Don't rebel against his word. Don't be like Hiel. Don't ignore and reject the warnings of the speaking voice. Rather come. Come to Christ even today. Come and repent and be washed in the precious blood. You know the faithlessness that was there in Elijah's day. It's getting darker and darker, wasn't it? As each preacher, each prophet was rounded up and killed. 
Then as a thousand were hidden by Obadiah in, in the caves. As if the lights were just being extinguished right around the country. It seemed hopeless. You know, in every hopeless situation that we see, there's always a lot. Reverse First Samuel chapter 3. It's a verse I went to many, many times and I can't preach it. Every time I've went to go and preach it, I can't settle. But it applies so much to our land and so much even to the situation in these days. First Samuel 3 tells us in verse 3 that there the lamp of God on high. In the temple of the Lord where the ark of God was and Samuel was laid down to sleep. That the Lord called. Ere the light went out. In other words, that, tent, that candle there, that lamp stand in the, in the temple, shining brightly, but as the work gets lower and lower, it gets lower, it gets darker and darker. So it's just down a little flicker. Samuel's laying down to sleep, Eli's already in bed. Then God spoke. <coughs> See, with God, the light never goes out. And when Samuel would have got up to run to Eli, the light would have had to turn back on. The room brightened once again for him to run. No child of God in Elijah's day, the lamps were going low. But God spoke. He had Elijah. And even though we may see across our land, as it were, the lights are getting lower. The darkness is coming in. Seems as if the gospel is not having the same effect anymore. Seems as if the, just the sin is just enveloping our land. The light's getting lower and lower. God speaks. And God will speak again. It's always darkness before the dawn. You look at any time of revival in the past, you look at the days of Whitfield, what England was before Whitfield came in the West Wing. England was a horrendous place of sin. And then God brought George Whitfield and John and Charles Wesley. You look at the state of Northern Ireland before Nicholson. You go back and look further, you look at the state of Northern Ireland and Ireland as a whole before 1859. God never lets the light go out. And he never will. I know that in our day that the lights will burn bright. And we would hear the voice of God call. Elijah, next week, we're going to be introduced to <coughs> man of God. But even may it burden us from what we've learned already, may it burden us to pray. To pray for the nation. To pray for our families, for our communities. Well, I'm unsaved, as I said. You see the warning signs that we give to the 
You think of your current state outside of Christ without a Savior. Don't live like hell. Don't ignore the warnings. The wrath of God. And put your faith and trust in Christ. Let's pray as we close. Father in heaven, we rejoice in the gospel. Rejoice, O oh Lord, that the gospel is still that shining light. Lord, we simply pray that in this darkening day, that the light of the gospel will shine brightly. That it won't simply flicker as the world grows darker and darker, but rather it will be put, put upon that lampstand. It will never be hidden under the bushel. But rather that it will brighten and eradicate the darkness. Lord, the darkness in souls, the darkness in society. Father, bless thy word to your hearts this day. Lord, be with us as we separate one from the other even now. Lord, we look forward once again to the opportunity to worship thee this evening. Lord, bring us again and bring others with us, O God. Work in hearts and draw men and women unto thy Son. In Jesus' name.